welcome to the Poetic Resurrection Podcast, where we explore perceptions, how self-reflecting questions can give you a better understanding of self. I'm your host, Sonia Iris Lozada. Stay tuned. This week, we have Luis J. Rodriguez, second time on Poetic Resurrection. I am so honored to have you back. And you're going to do a poetry reading of Always Running. Yes, yes. So thank you, Sonia, for bringing me back. I'm glad to have uh, this audience again. Um, and so I'm going to read this poem. And I'm going to try to give it, I'm going to read it first, and then I'll explain it a little better, because sometimes it's hard for people to get. But let me read it first. It's called Always Running. And by the way, this is not why I named my memoir Always Running. This poem came first, but it does. Anyway, it goes like this. All night vigil. My two and a half year old boy and his 10th month old sister lay on the same bed, facing opposite ends, their feet touching. They looked soft, peaceful, bundled there in strands of blankets. I brushed away roaches that meandered across their faces, but not even that could wake them. Outside the dark cover, night tore as their daybreak bloomed like a rose and a stem of thorns. I sat down on the back steps, gazing across the yellowed yard. A 1954 Chevy Bel Air stared back. It was my favorite possession. I hated it just then. It didn't start when I tried to get it going earlier that night. It had a bad solenoid. I held a 12-gauge shotgun across my lap. I expected trouble from the Paragons gang from the West Linwood Vario. Somebody said I drove the car that dudes from Colonia Watts used to shoot up the Paragons neighborhood. But I got more than trouble that night. My wife had left around 10 p.m. to take a friend of mine home. She didn't come back. I wanted to kill somebody. At moments, it had nothing to do with the Paragons. It had to do with a woman I loved but who to kill? Not her, sweet allure wrapped in a black skirt. I'd kill myself first. Kill me first? But she was the one who quit. Kill her? No, think, man, I was hurt, angry. But to kill her, to kill Paragon, to kill anybody. I went into the house and put the gun away. Later that morning, my wife came for her things, some clothes, the babies, their toys. A radio broken TV and some dishes remained. I didn't stop her. There was nothing to say that my face didn't explain already. Nothing to do but run. So I drove the long haul to Downey and Park near an enclosed area alongside the Los Angeles River. I got out of the car, climbed over the fence, and stumbled down the slopes. A small line of water rippled in the middle. On rainy days, this place flooded and flowed, but most of the time it was dry with dumped garbage and dismembered furniture. Since a child, the river and its veins of canals were places for me to think, places to heal. Once on the river's bed, I began to cleanse. I ran. I ran into the mist of morning, carrying the heat of emotion through sun's rays. I ran past the factories that lay smack in the middle of somebody's backyard. I ran past alleys with overturned trash cans and mounds of tires. Debris lay underfoot. Overgrown weeds scraped my leg as I streamed past recalling the song of bullets that whirled in the wind. I ran across bridges beneath overhead passes and then back alongside the infested walls of the concrete river, splashing rainwater as I threaded, my heels colliding against the pavement. So much energy propelled my legs, and just like the river, it went on for miles. When all was gone, the concrete river was always there, and me always running. Wow, I could so relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of rage and anger that comes up in our neighborhoods. I was living in Watts at the time uh, with my first wife. We had two babies, um, Ramiro, my son, who you might have met, and my daughter and the other, like two years apart. I was working in a steel mill, double shift, 16 hour shift sometimes. I was working so hard just to keep things going. The house is very small. You know, it, these houses in Watts were all run down and there was cockroaches and there was rats. There was all kinds of things going on. People would steal from each other. It was a rough place. But um, the real thing that happened is my wife went off with my friend. And yeah, that was the thing. She went off that night and that was it. Um, 
and you know they had an affair and the whole thing the whole thing just and i knew what what had happened because uh if you read the memoir you you realize that I'm, I'm i'm first clueless as to what's going on and then i start adding two and two together and at first it was such a painful thought and i was run gonna i got the shotgun and i was going to run down the street with the shotgun but i think that's not a good idea to do in watts so i couldn't do that and then i was going to start my car my 54 chevy that wouldn't start i went I was kind of in my own little madness for a while. I went to my kids, I hugged them and everything. I went to, and then I thought, well, I'm going to wait for her to come home and I'm going to kill her. I mean, that's, those are the thoughts that you're going through. And of course, I didn't really want to kill her. I didn't want to kill anybody. It was just the pain of being in that situation. And then I, I realized I'm not going to kill nobody. So I put the gun away, but then I'm still stuck in this thing. So what happened in the morning when I went through this little madness that I was going through, I got numb. I just numbed out. She came finally in the morning, and I went right past her. I knew what had happened. Uh, she did have the affair with this guy. Um, it destroyed everything, and she ended up moving everything out. But what I ended up doing is like, I, I have, I can't rage. I can't hurt my kids. I can't hurt her. I can't hurt anybody. I have to take this energy, and I started to run and run and run. And that's the kind of a depression that some people get where they get extra energized, not, you know how depression tends to pull you down. There's another one where you're just like, you don't know where to go. And so I just ran and ran and I would run for a long time and several weeks, actually, I couldn't even sleep. That's how uh, hurt I was. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's the backstory. And I've told you earlier that me and my wife, Camila, we, we have since, you know, reconcile we've all understood what happened i've been now happily married with trini for i've been together with her for 36 years you know we me and trini have our own kids i had another wife another situation but the thing is that's all the past uh she's still the mother of my kids and so i have to relate to her uh but i think we're much better about understanding how young and frustrated and stressed we were i was only 20 maybe 22 years old at the time when we broke up like that so we understand now. We're both immature young people. I married her. She was my high school sweetheart. And this is a good story. Mm-hmm. I married her when she was two months out of high school. And that's the way it was in the body, you know. Yes. And uh, yeah, we got married. We fell in love. It was the right thing to do. And then we had these kids and um, and the work and life trying to survive. You know how it is. And then she was, I was the only, her one and only. And she had never been with other people. She was one of these. East LA girl. She was an East LA girl, like tough. She would talk smack. She she knew how to be East LA, mm-hmm. but she was sheltered at the same time because the um, the gang girls were trying to recruit all her sisters. She had six sisters, and they would come to the house to, and her mom would beat the heck out of these gang girls. Her mom is a really amazing personality. She's still around. Felicitas. Uh, she's uh, she's an amazing person that someday I'll talk about. I wrote about her too, but anyway. She kept the gang girls away from her sister, the daughters, but they were still East LA. So my first wife was a big, loud talking, you know, tough East LA girl. But at the same time, she had never been out in the world. And um, that's what happened. She she went off. And that was the end of that relationship. <laughs> you know how that goes. But anyway, the, the deal is, what do you do with your rage? What do you do? I mean, some people will have, you know, will kill people, kill their families. I've, you know, we've seen this. Men in particular, don't they're raging all the time. Uh, I had to put that energy in the running and somewhere. I had to put it somewhere because if not, it would go to the wrong place. Because I grew up in the hood myself. Yeah. Uh, the, the Chicago hood, though. Yeah, I and, know. And I know, yeah. I know your hood, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and you know what? We lived in a tenement. There were roaches. Yeah. And it didn't even matter if you had an exterminator because they would leave. And then yeah. come back because your neighbor had them. Uh, everybody had them. And then yeah. you could hear the rats running in I the know. wall. Exactly. That's right. I lived in the same neighborhood as you did in Chicago later on. I know exactly what you're talking about. These are yeah. poor, humble park. These were the poor. Uh, I was a Puerto Rican neighborhood I was in. Um, poor neighborhoods, three story, six story, sometimes six flats and three story high. Yeah. They were rough rough places families had to live in them you know yeah because what choice did we have you know yeah. at that time yeah. now these areas that we grew up in are fancy they're now getting it's like, gentrified oh my god oh my god they're they got gentrified, gentrified big time and a friend of mine bought a house there 
and her family did. And now she has, and now she's in a great neighborhood. But when that house was bought, it was not a great neighborhood. Right. No, no. They identified my old neighborhood in San Gabriel Valley, the one that my, my value, my neighborhood that actually came out into the streets and everything. Now it's uh, mostly it got a- Asians came in with money. This is San Gabriel Valley when it used to be a dirt road, shacks. It looked like Appalachia, only more densely populated with goats and chickens in people's backyards, really? surrounded by white suburbs. White suburbs with sidewalks and strip malls. And we were we were these little enclaves of, of migrant community of Mexicans that were forgotten. And we were we started this gang. We were heavy duty, but by the eighties, the Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese people were coming out. And they were buying up these homes and getting rid of all the most of the real poor Mexicans. There's still a lot of Mexicans there, but these are Mexicans generally that can move up. All the poor people were sent to the desert. You know how that goes. They're all living in the desert now. And so yeah. but my neighborhood got spread out that way. Uh, they, they pretty much gentrified my old neighborhood. Yeah, because yeah. when I was growing up, we were told ahead of time that urban renewal, which is really yeah. urban removal, there you go. And then what happened in our neighborhood, people that owned their houses outright who were retired, yeah. they had to sell them because how yeah. they got them out was to raise the taxes so high that they yeah. couldn't pay the taxes so that they had to sell out the houses. Yeah, well, I'll tell you one other story. When I moved out of Logan Square, because we went from Humboldt Park to Logan Square, which is still big Puerto Rican, but Logan Square was being gentrified. I had bought a house with me and Trini and our, and our family, and we were going to move out to LA, move back. And I wanted to sell it to my neighbors. I said, go, go, go to a bank and get a pre-approved loan. My neighbors were Puerto Rican, Mexican, Guatemalan. They were neighbors. I said, go get them. And they all went because they wanted to get this house. I didn't want it to get gentrified. Mm-hmm. The banks would refuse any pre-approved loan, pre-approved loans to them. The only ones that came with pre-approved loans were white people with money. We, the only ones that could buy the house. It was really sad. I had to sell it to a gentrifier. Because nobody, they were banks wouldn't give it to the neighbors. Can you imagine? These are hardworking people. I'm not talking about a bunch of deadbeats. I'm talking about people who work hard, the families, they got jobs, the banks. So there is discrimination in the way that they handle that just to make sure that the gentrifiers can come in. And uh, that's what happened. It's really sad, but that's that's the way it goes. You know, that's was, that was strange that we're having this conversation. Last night I was watching an episode of The Last OG. Oh, and, I know I saw that. Yeah. And She wanted to get a house loan. She has a house, but she wanted to lower the rates. Yeah. So she had her son-in-law. I think he's her son-in-law who's white. Yeah. Show the appraiser the property. Wow. And she put pictures of white people everywhere. Oh, my God. (laughs) Because she's black. I know. She got got the low rates. It's funny, but it's not funny. You know how that goes. Yeah. I mean, but she, it, it was done in a comedic way. And she goes, hey, I'm taking advantage of my white relative. You know what? That's, but let's see what people don't know that that's the way it is. It is. I mean, we're and, making you know, even, but it's true. Yeah. And, and even though they can't discriminate now, there used to be restrictive covenants where you couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. And they actually said in LA, uh, Blacks and Mexicans, um, sometimes Japanese weren't allowed to live in certain neighborhoods. So that's why we, when I grew up, I started in Watts because my family moved from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico to Watts because there was no other place for us to live. We could have lived in, in just other poor neighborhoods. Watts was one of them. They forced you to go there. Now, what happens now is they can't discriminate, supposedly, but they do discriminate the way you're pointing out. Mm-hmm. Who's actually buying the house? Who shows up? Pre-approved loans. If you show up and you're a white person, you're going to get it. If you show up and you're a brown or black person, you're not going to get it. You know what I mean? These are things that we're dealing with even today. Yeah. And that's how they do it. You know, like they wanted the people out of the neighborhood. Yeah. So they raised the taxes really high. Yeah. And they couldn't afford. I mean, could you imagine? And we had my neighborhood was like a little melting pot. It's um, yeah. Bucktown. Yeah, I know had Ukrainian, I know Italian, Puerto yeah, Rican, yeah, yeah. Mexican had everybody, right? Yeah. Because it was like the middle of Chicago. So everybody yeah. met there. But the taxes went up so high that yeah. these retirees who bought their house to think that they were going to live Mm-mm. there further, they can't live there. They no, had no. to move out because my friend b- bought a home. Her taxes were a thousand dollars a month. That's crazy. That's worse. That's twelve thousand a year. That's worse yeah. than some rent. So that's that. No, you're right. And Bucktown, I know, became highly gentrified. It was a oh. very sweet neighborhood. A lot of people I knew it before it got gentrified. Now it's like 
You can't afford it. They, they play these games with our lives and our homes, and people don't get it. They think it's just us. We're failing as house, whatever, you know, that we, we can't maintain our homes. No, they find ways to entrap us, and they find ways to push us out. I'll tell you another thing. The boys will talk about this. They have this thing called debt to income ratio. Mm-hmm. That's how they pour, pour people out. It started after the 2008 meltdown, right? The home housing meltdown. But they punished poor people more because now we had equity in the house we have here in San Fernando. We couldn't get to it because our debt to income ratio was not adequate for us to get equity. Equity was building and building. I, we needed to borrow money. I had to pay to ARS. I had to pay a, a, a tax, I mean, a loan for one of my grandkids, you know, a student loan, you know, I had to pay all these things. They were putting liens in my house. And I had to get, and I couldn't get the equity because my debt to income ratio wasn't high enough. You can imagine. And I'm one of the more privileged people. I'm one of the better, better. Can you imagine a poor person, really poor? I'm not even that poor. And yeah, and then I never began to realize this is how they push poor people out. Middle yeah, class people, even, you know, yeah. and generally they're black and brown. So they, that's how they do it. They do it in ways that are insidious. And they said it, it seems to be like the cool thing to do, but they force people out who can't afford these these kind of ratios. Anyway, we can talk about that forever, but I think the point is this is by design. People know what they're doing when it comes to these things. Right. So you get into, you know, like one of the things I promised when I got out, it's like whatever I do, I do not want any more pests in my house. That's yeah. it. And I'm no, no. The, You're that right. California actually has a law. You can yeah. They, they have to take care of it or you could break a lease. You could do all of that if you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Good. there is when you were saying about the rage in the poem, yeah. there is that rage. And I yeah. think people like me and you who are really more artistic, we feel right. more rage when we're pushed into uh, employment that we have to do just to survive. We're not even t- yeah. talking about thriving, but just to put food on right. the table and to pay the rent. Yeah. And so we have to go into jobs because it's the, we have the same problem when it comes to jobs. Yeah. We have to go into jobs that we might hate. And I look for jobs because I'm considered highly hireable. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I turned down two jobs. Uh, I mm. won this morning because I didn't want to go into something I didn't want to do. You're right. No, I you're just, right. I didn't. I, I can't do it anymore. I have to follow things that work yeah. with me instead of thinking. And it's our own fault that we're trained this way to think yeah, in terms right. of lack. Yeah. We just think survival. We have to survive. We have yeah. to survive. And, and you and know, so Mexicans, there. Uh, yeah, that came to LA, uh, came as workers, you know, and so did the blacks. It came from Louisiana and Texas, uh, even the poor whites, but poor whites had a better way to move up. Um, here's a thing that people don't know. There is not one poor white neighborhood in Los Angeles. I know people have questioned me on this and I go, tell me which one it is. There are poor whites that live among Mexicans. Cause somebody said Van Nuys, Van Nuys is a Mexican barrio, barrio Van Nuys. Maybe some poor white families live there. Give me any neighborhood. There's no all poor white neighborhood in, there was in Chicago. You can't find one in L.A. What's up with that? Now, I know there's poor whites. You see them among the homeless. You go to the deserts. They're out there. They're with the poor people. They're following the poor people. There's poverty among whites is real. But yes. what I tell people that is that L.A., and I'm not sure it's just L.A., but a lot of these cities have pushed. There's no poor white people anymore as a community. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. These whites have money. These are whites coming in with money. Uh, and so I think that's what people don't understand. The poverty is being pushed out, but there is no poor white neighborhood that anybody can claim anymore. And I don't even know if they ever did. I'm, I was wondering, when, when was there a poor white neighborhood? I mean, people can point out, but generally they lived among um, Mexicans or blacks when they were poor. You know what I'm saying? There is no. So That happened in our, in our neighborhood, too. Um, in Chicago, we had some poor white people in our neighborhood and our mm-hmm. school, mostly Southerners. Yeah, that came up to the city. So that sure. must have been like a, a big thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had them in my neighborhoods in East LA too, by, by the way. Yeah. But they weren't, it wasn't their whole neighborhood was there. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. They're scattered throughout different yeah. areas. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what we had. Um, 
in Chicago, there were lower income neighborhoods, but not poor. Yeah, I'm talking about really poor. And yeah, I know like, the Chicago poor neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah, really poor black and brown communities in Chicago. They're really poor. Uh, you don't really find that among the whites, even in Chicago, because you're right, there's some lower income neighborhoods. I know you go uptown, maybe, you know, you go to a certain Albany Park, go to certain neighborhoods in Chicago, there's lower income whites, but you're not talking whites in deep poverty. You know, you are, you, when you talk about blacks and browns in Chicago, there's some deep poverty going on. Yeah, the only place I've seen whites in deep poverty is in the South. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Appalachia, parts of the South. Yeah. And th I've seen that. And um, this is why I talked about people when I mentioned to describe my neighborhood because they can't understand how L.A. County had neighborhoods like that. We had in San Gabriel Valley, there was 100 Mexican migrant communities. Almost all of them looked like Appalachia. People didn't understand that. I got pictures of it. I show them. They didn't know because nobody was covering that. I said, look, we were dirt, dirt poor, as dirt poor as any Southern poor people here in L.A. County. And the sad thing, we were surrounded again by people with money. So we were at war, not just with each other, body was fighting, uh, but we were also the, the well-off white power structure. That was very big in those areas, including the control of the police, the sheriff's deputies in particular, were really used like an army against these poor Mexican neighborhoods. I know I've written about it. San Gabriel Valley's completely changed now, but at the time I, I've written about how we lived and how we had a struggle with everybody. You know, the John Birch Society used to run all the school boards there. They used to run many of the city councils. They hated Mexicans, I'm telling you. Who is John so Birch? Uh, John Birch was a conservative white supremacist who eventually set up a, yeah, he set up this uh, organization. I think it started in Orange County. I forget where it was. But it was a very conservative white power structure group that eventually morphed into whatever Republicans, whatever it is now. Uh, but they controlled a lot of this stuff. And uh, I didn't even know this till later. And in fact, it was a white principal that told me because he actually was a nice guy. He became principal of my high school and brought me back to school. I wasn't supposed to go to the school because I got in the, I was kicked out and they said, you never come back. He brought me back. But he told me that he was battling these racist white, and he was a white guy. He was battling these racist white school boards that hated the Mexicans. So, yeah. 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 And, and you know what? And, and God bless people like that because yeah. they are the ones that also bring what's going on to the forefront because people yeah. listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't knock them down. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, they're who helped me when I was in yeah. second grade because I did not know how to speak English till I was seven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understood yeah. it, but yeah. it was a teacher who Mrs. Myers who knew mm -hmm. I was smart and she really, I mean, I had some great teacher mentors yeah in terms of regular right. mentors outside of school i did not have one i yeah, had to that's too figure bad. it out yeah know? i wrote about miss snelling she wasn't my teacher my brother was pushed back two years because he couldn't speak english he was put in mentally disabled classes you know what i'm saying yeah uh, they used to call it retarded which is not cool to call but that's what they were called and she liked him and said you shouldn't be he was nine years old in second grade i mean it was wrong so she helped him get back into the right grade she got him into theater she got him into sports she really did i mentioned her because her family even came to me and says thank you for mentioning her because my brother would have joined the gang would have been in bad shape but he was helped he became a gymnastic guy he became a martial artist he became a track runner he became you know he became really good because one person one teacher and she happened to be a white teacher who really cared for him. And I'm glad. I'm glad my brother didn't end up the way I ended up. But, <laughs> but it was uh, good that there was somebody that cared for her, like cared for him that way. You do need that mentor. I gave yeah. a, a speech at a gala. And the word mentor, it got me all emotional. Mm. And I'm like, damn, I'm giving a speech. I don't want to be emotional. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to me. <laughs> it does? Yeah. Oh, okay, oh, yeah, my not... trainee calls me a big crybaby. I, I, <laughs> I never used to be, you know, I grew up being hard. You know what that means. Yeah. But I, I always tell people, and I don't mind telling them, when I was a kid, I was a very sensitive kid. Boys are very sensitive. Yeah. But when you live in these rough neighborhoods, if you show your sensitivity, people will knock you down. 
They They'll will treat you ass. badly. They will. And that's what happened with me. I, I I'll tell you a story really quickly. I used to love being in my head a lot, play with mm-hmm. trucks, play with toys. But then I would play with dolls with my sisters. I never thought twice about it. So one day I'm nine years old and my neighbor, a eight-year-old, nine-year-old girl, invites me to play with dolls with her. So I did. I didn't twice about it. A couple of the little homies were walking by and saw me. And they were the same age, nine, 10 years old. The next week I'm getting harassed, called all kinds of names including names that get uh, homosexual names. I didn't know what they mm-hmm. were called everything you can imagine. And then they beat me up, beat me up really bad. Me. I was, I, they cracked my jaw. That's how my jaw got bad. And uh, they had me on the floor at nine years old um, and people were laughing at me. It was the most humiliating thing, but you know what happened after that? I promised myself I would never again be in that floor again. And then two years later, I joined a gang. Now I'm hard. Now I'm tough. Now I got homies. And then I got involved with all kinds of things that put me in that position. I took on everybody. You know what I'm saying? My rage from having been so humiliated became, I'm not going to let anybody ever do this to me again. So I fought everybody. I was uh, constantly in trouble for violent acts. I did heroin. I stole, but I never got caught for doing that stuff. I got caught because I was fighting all the time and or trying to shoot somebody and or trying to stab somebody. Something was going on <laughs> with me. You know what I'm saying? So I, I mentioned all that because it mutates, especially a man. We're going back to the rage issue. Mm-hmm. Men get highly mutated in those worlds. No, no, no Yoda's. You can't cry. You can't mm-hmm. show your feelings. You can't be sensitive. I became a mutated male and it took me many, many, many years to get back to that sensitive person. You know, uh, because I had to, I had to get back to my humanity because I couldn't keep living that mutated human being that I had become, you know. Well, yeah, you were fighting your your natural essence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? I think that men really sometimes get it really hard. You know, I understand. And I was a female because you're right. As a woman, you're raised Mm -hmm. to think that you're man should be a knight in shining armor Mm. and it's like oh my god i'm not a Mm. princess it's like why am i (laughs) expecting something that i'm not Mm. even you know so now i think it's guys have it easier guys are are allowed to be more now it's more yeah i think that's important and be expressive yeah. And to not see it as like, well, that's not you guys are supposed to do that. Now people can say, are you kidding me? We guys need to have a full emotional life because what happens is if they don't, they, the women end up carrying the emotional burden of families, of life, you know, in communities, it's the women holding up all the family stuff. The men are either detached or they're gone or whatever. And that's not right. You know, our communities need to have both men and women, both of them full, both of them with strong emotional lives both of them with resources instead of you know just dumping it all on the women and the men are closed off you know that kind of thing yeah because i mean i came from the the school of thought and we're not that different in age i think where the woman take care of the kids the father was the the bread maker and and raise i lay yeah yeah and (laughs) then you know what you uh but also you know like my dad didn't want my mom to work mm. at one point. And mm. then he got tired of being the only bread maker. So he goes, okay, you could work. <laughs> but it was <laughs> like, you weren't a man if you allowed your wife to work. That's very true. It's a very yeah. big problem. Yeah. And, and, and women were kept out of the marketplace, but that's changing as you know, and people, oh, that's, that's really, good. B- yeah. That's really I mean, good. now it's the opposite I've seen, you yeah. know, some men love to be at home with their kids. Yeah. And some yeah. women don't, you know, yeah. so <laughs> It works That's right. Nurturing, perfect. nurturing is not just the woman thing. A man could be a good nurturer. Oh, excellent! And I think so many kids want that nurturing from their parents, yes. from their yes. dad. You know, they like uh, my dad didn't show emotion till I got older, yeah. and I started asking him. Yeah. You know, and he, I mean, he's a little dark man that from Puerto Rico that went to Chicago mm. in the 1950s. Oh, it's a rough time. Uh, without speaking a word of English. Yeah, yeah. So he said he would walk up and down downtown. You know, he's only five, four wow. up and down downtown asking people if they knew anybody that was hiring because wow. he didn't even have a place to go. He just he yeah. was like 20 years old when he went. Yeah. And this guy said, well, I have a job for you. And he started walking him down an alley. He goes, oh, my God, this guy's going to kill me. Uh, oh, my God. 
And it was an entrance to a factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you had to go through the alley. And he said he was with him. He gave him a break and he was able okay. to rent a room in somebody's house. Yeah, yeah. Well, those are those are the stories of our families and my, and my mom, my dad too. But the point is, I think we can't, you know, in these working class neighborhoods, when you want to be a writer and artist, people put you down for it. Yeah. Because they tell you, get a job, be practical. What's wrong with you? You know, and my family was like that. I had aspirations to be an artist, to be a musician, to be a writer. They were not, no, get a job. They, they wouldn't support. My mom burned all my writings. Can you imagine? I had them in the grocery bags. And I had murals that I had painted because I started painting murals after I did all this graffiti art. She destroyed all the murals. I had plywoods of murals that I had painted. She, and I don't even to this day blame her. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. She grew up with that. This is a waste of time. Ready the tiempo. You can't be doing this. So I get it, but it's wrong for people to do that. And I'm glad that I, I could understand. And I don't blame my mom and dad. My dad was just like you say, frío, detached, emotionally detached. He didn't show. He didn't say I love you. Never. He just wasn't that kind of guy. That's what I would you expected a man to do. But I had to learn to be different than that. I look at myself now, and I, I think it's just sad because my parents were good, hardworking people. But the point is. I have to do whatever they did. I had to do the opposite. I tell my kids all the time, I love you. And I got four grown kids now. I got grandkids and great grandkids. I have to tell them love. Love is important. Love, hold, embrace. I have one of my sons. Well, I don't do, but one of them embraces us all the time. Me and my wife, he comes into the doorway and just embraces us. We've taught him this is what we do. It's, it's, it's the love that we have to show. I didn't grow up that way. And I get it. It's that hard life that you work. And don't complain, don't explain. That's basically the kind of world that we grew up in. I mean, also, it's like they worked from the moment they woke up to the moment they went to sleep. Exactly. So their only solace was yeah. sleeping. Exactly. You know, because you work really hard in a factory and you come home and all your kids are running around screaming. I mean, yeah. I was at one point and I, this is why I left home when I was 17. I was a little resentful because as the oldest kid, mm. You have to take care of everything. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like I had to make sure my brother and sister got to school. You know, um, my mom yeah. worked nights. Nice. She would leave by 3 p.m. I had to rush from school yeah. so that I could want it. It was yeah. a, it's a hard life, but that's what happens when you're the, the oldest. So as soon as I hit 17 yeah. and so I was really <laughs> good at school, you know, I got really good grades. I got into college in Miami and I left. I said, wow. you guys are going to have to take care of this now. There you go. Well, that's good for you. I'm glad you, you had that spirit. Um, the sad thing with my family is I, I got kicked out of 15. I totally get it. I was in bad shape with drugs and gangs and everything. And then, um, but my sisters, my two youngest sisters, were beaten down and partly because they didn't want them to be like me. I, I didn't know that I was the bad example. So my mom would knock them, beat them down, corral them, everything she could do. Both of them at 17 left the house, but one, got both of them got pregnant at 17 to leave the house that's really sad it, you know there, there's i think the three ages years between them but they both at 17 left the house by getting pregnant and it wasn't good obviously the guys they were pregnant with were no good either you know mm -hmm. one of them ended up one of my sisters married this guy for 18 years he beat the heck out of for 18 years awful relationship so I think that that's what happens if you don't, like we're talking about, if you don't find your passion, if you don't find what you're about, if you don't get that energy to say, I got to find my way, I got to make my way, um, you get corralled into other ways, other people's way. And patriarchy is very big about that. You know, women were supposed to have babies, supposed to be at home. And, and if guys beat you up, that's part, of, that's part of life. That's not right. But that's what these neighborhoods, a lot of them, they were yeah. about that, you know. Yeah, because that um, I remember that in order to get out of the house, you either had to be married, you were going to get yeah. married. So that's why a lot of girls yeah. in my neighborhood, they either got pregnant or they got yeah. married just to get out of their house. Exactly. That's and what is thing. it, 17 or 18 years old? That's exactly. so young. No, no, that's exactly right. And I, I think that's why it's important to point this out. Even with this poem, it was at a time when that was still going on. I was young, 22 years old. Uh, again, my first wife was my high school sweetheart she left when we got married you know she was too young and she two months out of high school you know but that's what we do that's what we end up doing now do we know each other do we really understand each other will we mature no 
you know, we found out later after two babies and everything else that we really weren't happy together. You know how that goes. Yeah. But that's sad. But that's but the freedom was there for the get to get out under those conditions. Then now you got to figure out what to do with this partner you're with that may not be the partner of your life. And that's part of the other struggle that we have to have. I, I want to say something else. I ended up working in all those industries too. And I worked in steel mills and I worked in smelters and I was a constructor because when I left the gang life, I didn't want to go back to crime. I actually absolutely didn't want to go back to heroin, to crime. And so work is the only thing. But then, and I didn't mind, except that it was taken away from what I really wanted to do, was to have a, an artistic, creative life. And I couldn't do it working. I couldn't do it um, with those jobs because, again, they took so much energy away, like you're saying. I mean, if you, it double shifts in the steel mill, all I could do was sleep in between and then go back to the mill. That's all you could do. And so my feeling is that it's, it's good in many ways that the industry, that industry is going away. There's still some left, but, you know, both Chicago and L.A. lost so much industry. Uh, Chicago, all the steel mills are gone. The stockyards are all gone, yeah, you know. Gone, yeah. yeah, everything that used to keep make Chicago the muscular city is all gone. But what happened, what had to happen? You got to shift. You got to change. Uh, Chicago's still vibrant, but a lot of it's arts, a lot of it's creativity, a lot of it is theater. There's more theater there now. There's a lot of other things. Well, they're uh, shooting people, a lot of yeah. films now there too. Film, yeah. So you have to shift to something else. And creativity to me is really where it has to go because this is why we started the just in the valley because this part of the valley was also working class. There was an auto plant in Panorama City. There was a, a big giant uh, brass foundry in Pacoima. There was all in, in all this defense industry, all kinds of industry. They're all gone. So what do you do? People are working in Walmarts or working at Kmart. So we're working at jobs that don't pay nothing. So creativity, the Achuchas is trying to plant that seed. Let's be creative. Let's be artistic. Let's go get work along your passions. As you're pointing out, you had to make those decisions. Go towards what really keeps you alive and what you can contribute as well. My personality is a being of service, you know, mm -hmm. but I thought that because I didn't think that was cool. I mm. want, you know, because I'm a, I'm an actor and I'm a singer. And so that's mm -hmm. where I wanted. I wanted that. Mm -hmm. And then I started saying, okay, I'm going to be of service. And the reason I stopped being of service, and I don't know if other people can relate to this, is that when you have that personality to be of service, I find that people take advantage of it. That, that's right. And that's not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that, to me, being of service is an innate, powerful thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But in our society, it's like, well, you, then you got to serve me or you got to serve a master. You got to serve a boss. You got it's, it's not really about that. But no. that's where we are. We got teachers who love that serving, but they're being treated badly. So, they, you know, after a while, being somebody that serves the world, serves community, serves others, gets to be like a bad, I don't want to do this because people do take advantage. And it know? sucks the life out of you because... Unfortunately, in Western society, mm -hmm. those are the jobs that don't pay. I yeah, know. And those true. are the jobs that should pay. I mean, our, our teachers who raise, basically mm. raise our children, if it wasn't for my teachers growing up, I don't know yeah. where I would be now. Yeah. I mean, my mom was really good about saying, follow your dreams. And her good. family are all musicians and artists. Oh, good. Yeah. So she was stopped being creative because she had to do money, but she yeah. did not stop us, even though I was called La Perdida for a while. Because <laughs> mm. I was always following my dreams and I came out to LA and I did yeah. the acting and the singing. Yeah. And I worked at it. I did yeah. not make a living at it, but I, yeah. I have worked at it. But those are the things that, you know, you got to follow your passion, but then at the same time, you can't get mm. angry because those passions sometimes don't develop and what i mean by that yeah, yeah. is that we work like i worked really hard for 30 years as an actor but i didn't work all the time so i couldn't make a living and what's sad is that 95 percent of the people in sag don't make a living you still That's have to true. have a different kind of job That's true. but i changed my way of thinking with it i decided i said you know what when i book something i'm very grateful to get it i'm not going to rely on it but I still love it. I still do. I would be lying if I said I didn't. Well, I'm fortunate in that I actually achieved the dream that I wanted. It, it wasn't easy, as you know, being a writer, especially if you're a person of color or, you know, you're a working class kind of person. This, this is hard. 
I was fortunate to be, make my dream as a writer happen. And to make it successful, I gave up all my work, all my old previous jobs when Always Running came out. Always Running was a door that I had to go through that, that opened all these other doors. And I didn't know I was going to do that. But I quit everything and ended up going to 30 cities in three months, pushing that book. And it was the best wow. thing I needed to do. I was on Oprah Winfrey. I was in Good Morning America. I was Entertainment Weekly. I was all over the place. The book became a bestseller. You know what I'm saying? I was very fortunate. It's a blessing. And, but I have to recognize that and recognize that other people don't get those blessings. It's not easy. A lot of writers I know never made it. And it wasn't that they didn't try. Like you're saying, actors and singers. And a lot of people try to get into these industries. They're not easy. They're not easy for white people. You can imagine how it is for women and for people of color. But we still got to try. We got to say, I put my life out there. I did it. It isn't about the fame or glory or even the big money. It's about that I'm trying to live out my life. That, to me, is what I wanted to honor with the Achucha, my aunt, because she was a creative person in the 50s, 60s, which things were even worse. Yes. She was an independent woman that played guitar, painted, sang songs, did poetry, um, which was an extraordinary creative person. She never made no fame. She never made no money. Nobody knows who she is. I know who she is. And I've named everything after her because I wanted to honor that spirit of going for it, of just being creative in spite of all the obstacles. So I'm very fortunate, but I always tell people, you got to keep trying to live out your life. It, it's the fame and glory and money. Most people don't get it, but yeah. that shouldn't be the way you do it. Now, if you get it, that's the icing and the cake. Make the most of that, but don't do it for those reasons. Necessarily. Right. I get spurts, you know, <laughs> and uh, but. It, today, I just because, you know, you when you are a creative person, you work really hard and stuff that doesn't make money until later. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, so you're investing and investing and exactly. investing. But when I got offered this job, you know how in the gut of you, mm. it says no. Yeah. You know, know. and it's I like I kept I, I kept saying, but I need I need to have the extra income. I know. Do I have the time for this job? No. <laughs> it's yeah. like, a, I, I was happy that it was the first time I said, you know what? I'm not going to be in, in that. I'm going to really follow what is important Good to you. me. And yeah. you have to do that at times. As long as you yeah. are going out to just buy everything and live in a mansion. See, I'm, I'm not course. into that. To me, You're it's right. like, it's more stuff to take care of. Yeah, exactly. But Oh, and let me tell you, at this time, it's like, it's too much. I, my apartment is too much to take care of. So, <laughs> But, you know, you have the right attitude because there are people, like, for example, when Omish Ryan did make big, uh, me and my wife decided we're not going to buy Lexus. We're not going to buy swimming pools. We're going to put it in Tia Chucha. Basically, that's what happened. I mean, we bought our first house because of my getting money through the, through the writing thing. And then um, when we came to LA, we had sold that house. We made some equity and we put it into Tia Chuchas. Uh, we bought a house here, but we also, Tia Chuchas became the recipient of the royalties and everything for five or two, I don't know, I think it was five years, me and my wife kept Tia Chuchas going. We didn't have really any grants for it, but what it wasn't. And then we developed a nonprofit so that it would create its own funding source away from us and mm -hmm. pretty much has been doing that ever since i mean i donate whatever i can i help raise money and everything but pretty much the church just has made it on its own um with this beautiful staff that we have a beautiful board that we have the volunteers we have such great people there they have made it happen me and trini initiated got it going got the combustion engine going but they have carried that further so that um now 20 years later we have a beautiful space to got 10 young people running it. We have a lot, a lot of interns, a lot of help. We got donors. We got a lot of grants from people. You know what I'm saying? Now it's become well known. Um, I don't have to put any of my own money in there anymore. But that was the initial thing. Why put it in something that it's not going to amount to anything? Swimming pool, Lexus. Well, all these things. That, I don't yeah. care about that. You know, You know, I had, um, to me, my memories are more valuable than a possession. Yeah. So a friend of mine told me that she wanted to get one of those fancy TV uh, refrigerators with the TV in it and everything. Right, and right. they're a minimum $8,000, right? Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. But she already <laughs> had a really nice refrigerator. So I said, always think on your deathbed, 
what do you think is going to be important to you? Is it going to be, oh, I had a fancy refrigerator or is it going to be, hey, I was able to travel. I wrote a book. I did a play. I did. You know, those are the things that matter. Yeah. And, you know, and it's good to have a partner like my wife who doesn't have those big uh, ambitions either. I mean, we have a good life. We raise our kids good way. They didn't suffer. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But we don't have those big lujoso. We don't want anything big luxury. We don't need that, you know. And I'll tell you something else. This is kind of sad. Uh, but she's my third wife. When I married her, she didn't even want a diamond ring. I had given a diamond ring to my first wife and second wife. And I told her, I'm tired of these diamond rings. They don't really mean anything. Mm-hmm. Relationships you have to build. The diamond is in a relationship. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I was telling her, let's make the let's make the diamond be how we love each other and care for each other. And she agreed. She says, I don't really care for diamond rings. I mean, I'm so glad. You know how people got that way. I'm not, I'm not saying don't give somebody a diamond ring. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. But what I'm saying is that after oh, marriages and relationships didn't work, I realized it wasn't about that. And me and Trini have developed a very beautiful jewel of a relationship that took a lot of, lot of work to get there. And that's what we've done. And that's more important. And to me, that's what really Tia Chucha is. And even in our household relationships, like you're saying, they're, they're what give us memories. Build strong, good relationships. They last forever. They last great. You have memories with people, you know, family, whatever it may be, your best friends, the people around you. I have a great community now that I can go to. I trust this community. I love this community. They love me because I, I'm there for them. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's important that you treasure and really treasure, that's your real treasure, and build on that. That, to me, is where the richness of our communities can come from. Yeah, it's true. I, You know, to me, I it's strange because I'm so much happier now. When I was mm-hmm. in, I used to be like a director of administration for a corporation. I used to do uh-huh. all of that. And it yeah. was, I was at work 50, 60 hours a week. And that's yeah. not a way to live. No, you, you know, can't. it's like that job owned my life. And that's then, that's right. yeah. And what I ended up doing was I would take three day vacations, like almost every, every weekend wow. instead of taking, cause I had a month of vacation. So I would just do long weekends. Yeah, so yeah, those, yeah. those 40 to 60 hours were in four days, a lot of times. Wow. And I would just go away. I take a trip somewhere just to get away. And then one year I decided when I did my taxes, I realized I spent a third of my income getting away. Wow. So I but said, that, no. But that's good, though. That's good you did that. Yeah. Well, it's then what important. happens is I ended up taking a less uh, a lesser job yeah. without the, the management. I mean, it was still management, but not with the pressure of that position. Yeah. And I made less money, but I was much happier. And I think that's what really what people have to be clear about. I tell people, you know, that everybody has a certain gradient. In other words, there's certain ways that they're going to move. Mm-hmm. And you can change, but you can't really change from that gradient. You can change very better and improving on that gradient. Um, like I said, I was a sensitive kid. That was my, my gradient. I had to build on that. Some people aren't that way, but they got to find out what, what there is. Like you say, some people are more service oriented. Some are great educators. Some are great artists, some creative. Some are great business people. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just knowing what your gradient is and proving and getting better about that. Mastering the skills and genius you already have. You know what I'm saying? Mastering it in such a way so that it becomes what you say you, you own and not others. And it doesn't own you. That's the important part of life. And I always tell people, including gang kids, listen, man, I turned my life over to gang, to heroin, to all kinds of things. It owned me. Mm-hmm. All the drugs, it owns you. All the alcoholism, eventually it's going to own you. That's not what you want. If you want that, I can't stop you. You know. But if you look that kid in the mirror and you love that kid, that's the only person you have to answer to. And you got to make sure, am I really owning my life? Am I really living the life that I should live? What is my gifts? What do I want? These are very important questions that especially young people need to ask. Most people don't ever help young people with that. You know, they just yeah. go through whatever conformity they have to do, whatever issues they expected of them. And then they go through and they realize that when they're middle age, what have I done with my life? You know? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and we, so much of us, I mean, we do it. I think that we allow fear to control us. Yeah. 
and we grew up being poor and knowing what that feels like and knowing what it's like to put a meal on the table. And so that owns us, those beliefs own yeah. us. Yeah. And that's the thing is we have to change those beliefs. And that is a very difficult thing to do. It's yeah. very difficult. And again, that's why I give my, my parents a pass. That's what they believed. That's what they feared. And I understand it. I don't want to live that way. You know? mm -hmm. But I totally get why they had to live that way. You know, generations of peons and hardworking people and people working at ranchos and moving here in the country, working in the industry. My mom told me that when she was nine years old in South Texas, you live in Ciudad Juarez, they went to South Texas to pick cotton, starting at nine years old. So that was her life. And so I remember when I was nine years old, she told me that story. She told me, now you got to go work. She had me take this rusty push lawnmower and drag it down the street and cut people's lawns for 25 cents. And again, it was funny because nobody really had lawns. They had dirt, you know, a little bit. But I did weeding, a whatever I had weeds. to do. I had a lot of, I did a lot of work. But, but it was like, now you're time to work. Nine years old because yeah. she worked that way. So I get it. And I totally understand. It makes sense to me. But I don't think we have to live that way. We shouldn't have to live that way. No, none of our kids should have that as a prospect in their life. It's good to have a work ethic, as you know. I'm glad that I did work. I'm glad that I worked in that industry. I have a high work ethic. Working for myself, I could be lazing around. I don't. I get up early. I work hard. I get my work done. But I also relax hard. I mean, you know how people say they party hard? I don't mm -hmm. party anymore. <laughs> but I relax. <laughs> I do relax. Me and my wife, right, when we're done, we watching Netflix or we're reading or we're just, you know, we just relax for it. Just get away. It's not, um, it's not about partying or anything, but it is about taking that break, that reflective moment just to get away. That to me is, it all works together very, very well. Yeah. You need that time to quiet the mind. Yeah. Cause that exactly. mind is constantly and let that little exactly. soulful energy of creativity. Yeah. Yeah, show yeah. itself because i mean when i meditate and in my dreams that's what most of what my poetry is about is yeah. very surrealistic i mean there are some that are kind of hardcore yeah. and we had talked last time we talked which for those of you uh, listeners I, I um lost the interview i don't know how we talked about you know going through experiences and going through abuse and going through many things as you grow up that and I don't know if you noticed that as uh, people just say, oh, you can, you, it makes you tougher, yeah. you know? Um, well, you know, sometimes it, it does yeah. and sometimes it sometimes doesn't. Sometimes it does. I think that's the point. I think being tough, if it's not a facade, is important. You know what uh -huh. I'm saying? Have yeah. backbone, have courage, you know, stand up for yourself. But people have mismutated toughness now, you yeah. know, which is, means I want that. I'm going to, I'm going to, take all this nonsense and go, that's not being tough to me. You know, just the, I want that esto, I want that lo, lo otro. It's not about that. I think it's about um, really standing up when you need to, having the backbone to go through life, the hardness of life, the ins and outs. Uh, my relationships were bad, but I totally don't mind having gone through them because I finally found a good, decent, loving relationship. I get it. If nobody finds it, they, they still got to struggle through that point is you got to go through that i worked in those industries i don't regret it i'm glad that i did i'm just glad i'm not doing it no more <laughs> you know i'm glad that i found my way so i think those are the things that people mutate toughness because i grew up with the idea that you have to be hard and tough but that was a facade you know just, you don't you know no. and, and i'm glad that modern thinking is more about being nurturing yeah. You know, uh, the sensitivity part is now appreciated. That's what a lot of these yeah. leadership programs are teaching you now. Yeah. Yeah. You have to know what the personality is of the person next to you so yeah. that yeah. you know how to deal with them. You know, it's more yeah. about what is it called? Authenticity. Exactly. Yeah, it is authenticity. And often what's authentic to me also has the word authoring. It's being authentic, but also that you can author this life story that you have to live. Yeah. You know, and not necessarily writing it, though that's part of it, but authoring your own life story. What were you meant to live and how do you live that? You know? Exactly. Yeah. I don't regret all the hardships yeah. because honestly, I have a lot to write about. <laughs> there you go. That, that's also true. I, I, I made that. I'm okay. I made a living doing that. And I, I, so I can't say that's not true. 
I made a living writing about my hardships. But the point is, I survived them. I'm here. I'm quite healthy. I have really great relationships. We built a great institution at the Achuchas. So that's when you can look back and say, wow, what was that role? How hard was that role? I was talking about my son because my son, Ramiro, who um, works with me now, and is, he's been out of prison for 10 years, and he was in prison for a long time, 15 years, and he did, a lot, he suffered a lot. He went through a lot of bumps in the road and relationships and everything. But I have to say, now he's 46 years old, he's becoming a really fountain of positivity in our family, as well as in the community. I know it's hard for him. Sometimes he gets going. He can get triggered very easily. And we've talked about that, not to let that happen. But he, he's genuinely positive in spite of everything. You know, I see him smiling. I see him always trying to go for the positive thing. And I think that's important. It, it isn't that he went through hell and back, but that he got, did come back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. It really is. It's that gratefulness that you're yeah. out of it. Yeah. You know, that to me is you're grateful to be alive. You're grateful yeah. to have overcome it because that yeah. people should be extremely proud of themselves to overcome that. Yeah. And you I know? think a practice of gratefulness should be in everybody's life. Um, right. I had to do that. I, I, you know, like I said, I was on heroin. I was drinking. I, for 28 years, I was in the dead attic. I finally sobered up. But one of the things that keeps me sober. And I've been sober now for 28 years. I was oh, 27 years. I'm very, yeah, I've, so I've actually beaten sober more than I was, is to have a practice of gratitude. Because, you know, addicts aren't great, grateful by nothing. And I had to, I do it every day. Every day I find a moment to just be thankful. And now we're in that Thanksgiving season and everything. But I think that should be a daily practice. Yeah. Uh, gratefulness for the blessings you have. There's terrible hard things. I get it. And so we got to put that in perspective by yeah. being grateful for the things that are blessings. Everything that we live and everything that we shared um, is it's got hard lessons. And that's really the, uh, I tell the guys when I go to prison, I, I work in prisons and do the halls. And I tell them, what are you going to do with everything you've been through? You're either going to curse the world or you're going to bless the world. Make that choice to bless it. Your wisdom, what you've learned, how hard your life was, but how you found the gems in it give that to the world bless others mentor young people so that they don't enter that kind of life help somebody so that they don't end up in the same place you were in that to me is what i tell them and you know most of these guys they appreciate that and they want to do that they yeah. want to bless the world not curse it thank you so much for reading always running yeah and thank you so much for the interview yeah and that's it thank you we'll so do much. it again thank yes, you yes we'll definitely do it again okay take care <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Poetic Resurrection Podcast. Available on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, and many other podcast platforms. Please visit us and subscribe to our newsletter at PoeticResurrection.com for the latest information and updates.